Sometimes your friendships are going to be tough and you got to ride the wave so you make it another 20 years. But let me tell you this, and I mean this with all of my love, if you do not unconditionally love that person, then yeah, the friendship's conditional. How often you talk, when you see them, how often you agree, how good you make each other feel. If your love is conditional, that friendship is conditional. But if you unconditionally love someone, you're going to ride the wave into the next 20 years because you're going to see like, okay, we're just having a moment. We're having a moment. The friendship isn't conditional. But if your friends say, well, I don't talk to you every day. So like, I can't be friends with you. That's a conditional friendship. And that's fine. That's valuable. I have friends who are like, hey, I can't talk to you more than once a month. Maybe every two months. Is that okay? And if it's not okay, I understand. But I, I, it's got to be conditional, right? My unconditional friendships are not going to say I need to talk to you every day. Because like, that doesn't make sense to me. There are clever ways and not so clever ways to gossip. The clever way would be to say something like, I'm so worried about Agnes's drinking. I genuinely hope she doesn't end up losing this job as well. The non-clever way would be to say something like, Did you guys hear Agnes has started drinking again? Guess it's just a matter of time until she gets fired. I'll explain that more in depth later in this video, as well as female competition, jealousy, and more. But to get there, let's first take a look at how we got to where we are. The first half of this video will be based on this article, Our Grandmother's Legacy, Challenges Faced by Female Ancestors Leave Traces in Modern Women's Same-Sex Relationships, and then I'll share some of my personal experience. Throughout Alrighty. most of human history, women have heavily depended on their male romantic partners for the survival of not only themselves, but you know, of their offspring. Naturally, other women were their primary competitors as each woman wanted to secure a committed, high-earning partner as an impoverished man meant lesser chance of them and their offspring surviving. Now, men experience competition too, but women feel especially competitive jealous and experience distress when it comes to looking attractive, since this is what men throughout history have valued the most in women. In other words, it wasn't just women that felt threatening, but attractive women in particular. So generally women from a young age prefer not to be surrounded by friends who surpass them in physical appearance. And if we look at two female friends, the less physically attractive friend is more likely to have a heightened romantic rivalry within the friendship. And so attractive women show a heightened preference for gay male friends in part because they perceive gay men as more likely to provide honest and helpful romantic advice than other women. Now I want to chime in here with a quick anecdote. So once upon a time, I was living with a bunch of models, like actual working models, all incredibly gorgeous. And prior to moving in, I hadn't seen them, I just knew they were models, but I did feel intimidated. I had this preconceived notion that they just wouldn't be very nice. Well, actually, they were the nicest group of girls that I had ever lived with. And prior to that, I had lived with other, you know, normal looking, average looking girls. You know, no wonder everyone thinks I talk fucking fast. Everyone talks so slow. I love her. I almost want to speed her up, but it's already a short video. Bro, she is so sweet. Why is she paused between every word? Anyway, I can tell the full story of that another time if you're interested. Now let's get back to this article. Now as women, we might not only be threatened by other attractive women, but also by women who signal sexual openness. This is because in- Yo, this B-roll. Short across cultures, men are more likely to commit infidelity and to engage in casual sex. And so when other women, you know, dress provocatively, for example, we might respond with more hostility and rude comments than we would if that same person was dressed more conservatively. We're also less willing to introduce a woman who exhibits cues of sexual openness to our boyfriends. Now this whole- <laughs> Okay, very interesting bubble. Definitely very- f I always say straight girls got lots of problems. I feel like straight women are suffering. Um, uh, women who who center their life around men. You know what I mean? Like, damn, that's so interesting. This bubble gives me anxiety. I'm gonna be real with you. This video does give me anxiety already. Like, I'm, 
I'm anxious about the way she's talking because I'm like, what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? I come from a bubble where my partner and I both have like different gendered friends. We're both nerds. We live in nerd communities. Like, they're like, you know, Maiden says, is she saying the gossip is male centering? Well, not just the gossip, but she's, well, I don't know what she's like. The This example is the one that's giving me the most anxiety. The fact that she's saying like, oh, sometimes you might not want to bring your hot, more sexually open female friends like to meet your boyfriend. I'm like, what? Is my friend hitting on my boyfriend? Because I'm going to cut her out of my life. Like, what are we talking about? I'm watching Love is Blind and Sarah Ann sends a DM and I'm like, cut her off. This is inappropriate. Like, I've already warned my friends. If you ever say anything to me like, oh, if your marriage ends, out of my life. Or if, if some, if the, well, again, like, oh, this is, I've obviously, I know the bubble. I know the bubble, right? Kay says, I've seen these games get played. It's real. Oh, it's real for sure, bro. It's definitely a bubble. But I just think these people are all fucking toxic as shit. You know what I mean? Sage says, but she's describing exactly what the girls, girls movement is happening, happening, is trying to combat. I think the girls, girls movement falls into a trap, though. I do. I think the girls, girls are so toxic, mostly because they're mad at me. You know, the Manifesto girls, girls communities, they're so toxic. I think they swung too hard. They swung the pendulum too hard. They fucked up. I do. I think they're trying to counterbalance. Like, guys, just fucking don't give a fuck. I feel like the girls, girls bubbles center their life around men. That's what I was trying to get through on the last panel. And I didn't, I didn't do it well. The last panel I did with the girls, I didn't do it well. But I feel like the girls, girls bubble centers their life around men in a combative way versus this bubble is more in a pick me way. Do you get what I'm saying? I feel like the girls, girls bubble, I'm going to say it again, is, is combative against men and centers their life around men. And this bubble centers their life around men's approval because it's like a pick me bubble. And both of them feel weird to me. Who cares about men this much? Not me, not even my gay friends. I just feel like men cannot matter this much. After a certain level of introspection. It's true even when it's not in person. So women who are exposed to attractive fashion models who, you know, assume flirtatious and sexual openness, they experience heightened jealousy about their relationship. Maybe I'm just too ugly for this bubble. Maybe that's it. Do you think we just live in like a mid bubble? Are we all too mid? You know what I mean? I just don't believe any of these people. Or maybe I just don't care, bro. Maybe I just don't care. Like, I just genuinely feel so superficial. And feel compelled to... But anyways, let's be open. ...derogate and ostracize those models. Now, this suggests that female psychology is well-designed to detect and thwart threatening same-sex rivals from undermining their partnerships. Now, although to most people today... Literally, one of my friends was like, can you talk to my girlfriend so she knows you're not into me? And I was like, ew. And it is stupid, but it's like a game they play. And I had to like reassure his girlfriend that like I'm not into him. And it was so annoying because I'm like, this is dumb. But they think it's cute. They're like, oh my God. Like, I just like fucking. Hey, at least in the West, losing a male partner isn't typically detrimental to our survival. The historical cost of losing a male partner and therefore our own and our children's access to resources and survival is still deeply ingrained in us. By the way, she's a very pretty person. Like, I like her aesthetic and her setup. It's like very nice. But why does she seem sad? Is that her aesthetic? She seems so sad. You know? Yaya says, yesterday you called us fat and now today you're calling us mid. This feels toxic. No, 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 no. We might be fat and we might be mid. But we are thriving in our joy. Okay? We're the least self-harming. Okay? We're the most stable. And we're the best person to have in other people's lives. Because we're happy. I'll take it. I'll be fat and mid to be happy, bro. I'll be fat and mid to be joyful. I'll be fat, mid. Let's go, okay? Fat, mid, and happy. That's our new saying on this channel. We're fat, mid, and happy. Fuck it, bro. Okay? Girl, I go to bed every day happy. I wake up every day happy. And that's all I got to say. These videos feel depressing as fuck. I ain't depressed enough to make this kind of content, girl. Whew. I kind of feel like I need some therapy after all of that.
and we're only getting started. Oh, you too? Well, good thing that this video is in paid partnership with BetterHelp, the platform that connects you with a therapist oh my who, goodness. who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. Over 4 million people have used BetterHelp to want to listen to you. Help you can have it specific for less. And we want to find one that comes slash Lana your first month. Love that. Wait, what happened? What is this text? The right person doesn't take energy. The right person gives energy. Across ages and cultures, you know, okay. women, girls have been much less physically aggressive than boys and men. And this, according to this article, is because historically women did not want to risk being physically harmed or worse, put their Raven says, okay, but actually there's a phenomenon that traditionally attractive females are sadder. Oh yeah, I thank God every day I'm not a 10. I thank God every day I'm not a 10. 10s are sad, bro. Pretty people are some of the saddest fucking people I know. Ugly people are some of the bitterest people I know. Ugly people are bitter and pretty people are sad. And I thank God I am mid every fucking day. I got an ass for days. And I got happiness for life, bruh. Their child at risk. However, women are equally, if not more likely, to engage in indirect aggression. So what is indirect aggression? It's basically the attempt to disrupt a person's social opportunities and relationships using tactics such as, you know, spreading rumors and gossiping and disclosing secrets and ostracism. And it's usually quite effective, you know, since we tend to dislike people who we have learned negative information about, especially if that information comes from multiple sources, it's believed to be more credible. And as women, we do experience social exclusion more frequently as well as online rumors and cyberbullying and so on. Now, while hearing all of this might make you want to sign up to therapy, and you should, go to betterhelp.com slash Lana. Us women are also each other's biggest allies. You know, we- Ooh, I want all of those flowers. Highly value our same-sex friendships and mm -hmm. we strongly desire intimacy within these relationships. And women, more so than men, experience high levels of worry and distress about potential friendship abandonment or replacement. See, historically, having strong relationships with other women also meant survival, you know, both for oneself and for one's offspring. Women relied on- I'm not gonna lie, it's really hard for me to pay attention to the way she talks. I never got into her content. I like, again, her aesthetic tells my brain I should like it, but when I try to watch it, I think this is why I, every day I'm more and more convinced my neurodivergency just does not let me pay attention to these things. Do you think, do you guys like the way she, is it her canter? Is it like the, the way the- it's like the way she speaks. She's like, again, aesthetically, I, sh I like the aesthetic. Why? But when she talks, this is, yeah, this is, I'm always going to be fascinated at how my brain, I'm not hearing anything. I want to know about her life. I don't like this general, maybe it's too vague. Is it just too vague? I also don't know the goal of the conversation. I think I'm lost. Oh, that's what it is. Sorry. This is my neurodivergent thing. What is the goal of this conversation? The lies of female friendships, competition, and jealousy. Okay, so we're following a train of thought that's going to lead us to her disproving the bubble that says female friendships are competitive and jealous. Okay, got it. On midwives and, you know, the whole it takes a village thing. We also know that social support... Should I speed it up? I'll speed it up. You guys seem like you want me to speed it up. Let's speed it up is strongly linked to better health and increased longevity. Another thing that I found to be particularly interesting when I read this article. Ah, oh, yeah, Maiden says she sounds like she's so bored, so I instantly think she's boring. Yeah, why does she seem bored with her own video? She's dead in the eyes. She's got dead eyes. I'm assuming that's a, a trick, right? She's very popular, guys. She has like a million subscribers. A lot of people know who she is. Do you think the dead in the eyes thing is like on purpose? article, perhaps because I hadn't really I don't know, thought about it before that, was the part that discusses how women relative to men 
were more or more strongly prefer equal distributions of resources and power over unequal distributions. So for instance, among children, girls are more uncomfortable than boys when selecting group leaders. In adolescence, girls are more distressed than boys by friends surpassing them in popularity or close friendships, and we assume successful or popular females to be entitled. Popular girls are often disliked, ridiculed, and ostracized, and women more often fear that their female friends' admiration will turn into envy or resentment, and so they minimize their successes to avoid coming across as proud. Now we see this desire for even distribution across the board, and here are some examples. Both women and men preferred male over female leaders. Women expect female leadership candidates to perform worse at their job and less likely to be promoted. Female employees report more support from their male than female supervisors, and there is much more. You know, even within sports, where competition is you know, the explicit goal, female athletes show less positive or friendly behaviors towards the opposing team following a match than do male athletes. So what do we seek for in our female friendships? It seems that women strongly prioritize kindness in their same-sex friendships, and compared to men, we hold higher expectations for our friends just overall, especially for trust and empathic understanding, loyalty and commitment. And we tend to have a stronger desire to support or to provide support and reassurance to friends in need, and girls and women who don't support their friends tend to have fewer friends. And this standard for kindness is especially high for popular girls because otherwise they might be perceived as threats. Compared to men, we are also more likely to question our friendships if they do not live up to certain standards or signs of devotion, such as friends who, you know, cancel plans, fail to stand up for us, or disclose our secrets. So basically any cues of disloyalty. And now touching on jealousy, girls report stronger jealousy over their friends' relationships with others, along with heightened monitoring of their friendships. And a similar pattern is observed among adults, with women feeling immense jealousy over their, you know, best friends forming a new and potentially more intimate relationship with a same-sex peer, in part because we fear that our friend is now going to tell his new friend our secrets and potentially ruin our reputation. Now this might all seem quite complex. Okay, maybe it's just me, but my friends and I have different friend groups. And I know for a fact that when I tell my bestie something, she's telling her bestie something about me. And I'm telling my bestie something about her. Like, there is a deep understanding that we go, I have a best friend, I have multiple best friends. And when those best friends tell me something, obviously, we talk to our other friends about those things. Not to gossip, but sometimes to gossip, let's be real. But also to like, talk to somebody to talk about the thing because they're not involved in it. Because sometimes those friends give us a thing that's like, oh, that's a heavy burden. I need to talk to somebody else about this. But also they don't know each other. They're not connected. Like my friends are not friends with my friends. They're never going to meet unless they're meeting at my birthday party, which they will never do. Like my friends do not know my friends. So I assume that my bestie would be telling their bestie, their other bestie, because they have more than one bestie about, or even their friends. Like, hey, I'm going through this thing with Brittany. Can I talk to you about it? Yeah, obviously. What, I'm not, oh, you can't tell anyone about me? Like, you can only tell your therapist? Like, no, go talk to your other friends about it. Bro, brainstorm with them. And then talk to me back. See if they have a new tool to get. Okay, so it would make sense if my friends were all friends together, maybe. But even then, like, I'm, I think I get this from my family. We're all pretty open. So, like, I have nothing to hide. So, like, if my best friend had another best friend, that wouldn't be a threat to my relationship with them because, like, our relationship is specific. Like, I'm not threatened by my one sibling having a friendship with my other sibling. Like, we're all siblings. I guess I'm confused, but also I get it. What a bubble. Okay, okay, I'll get it. I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. You know, because there are incentives to compete with other women for high quality romantic partners, as well as incentives to form strong bonds with other women. And so, ideally, you would you know, get the benefits of male investments as well as female cooperation and support. And now this article did point out one. Oh wait, okay, good insight. Raven says, this all comes from the scarcity mindset. I struggled making friends all my life. So when my best friend would make new friends, I felt jealous. Okay, that's fair. That's a good mindset. Okay, so that allows us an idea of like wh who's, okay. Okay. Girls, girls, groups can be our groups be like this it's super toxic competitive and jealous it can be yeah 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 okay so everyone's on a journey I will say I've always had like I've had issues with friendships and stuff where you're like hey what are we doing are we growing in different directions like what's the conversations okay I think you learn this is a part of growing and learning is like what does it mean to be a friend with somebody and I think it's complicated and it's never going to be the same none of us are going to describe 
exactly what friendship means to us in the same way, which is why it's personal to the consciousness, right? It is personal to the consciousness. So I guess like, uh, hmm, okay. Yeah, I can see the struggle in this regard. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I don't struggle making friends because my requirements for friends are pretty low. I don't struggle for finding intimate friends. I've been really lucky in that way. But ultimately, I only have three close friends and everyone else are close, but not like 2 a.m. call close. So there's like a line of vulnerability. But then even with my other friends, I share a version of vulnerability with them because like they can see my vulnerability more than even some of the times my inner circle can because like this, see, even my inner circle has a hard time seeing every part of my vulnerability. So I have friends that can see it and we can have a symbiotic, I'm seeking symbiosis. I'm always seeking a symbiotic relationship with people. And that's what I think the friendship is built off of, right? So I understand, mm, I also understand being forced into friendship and then realizing 20 years into friendship, like how do I end this friendship? Cause like I'm ready to move on. I think you have to learn how to break up with your friends. Okay. 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 I'm brainstorming. I can see this. I even know people with tons of friends and an inner circle who still feel lonely, which I think is a relationship with their consciousness and they're lacking it, right? They keep thinking like men will solve it, women will solve it, but like, no, it's a relationship. Can you imagine having all the friends, all the inner circle, having people, but like still lonely? It's a relationship with your consciousness. So I also do think I come from a bubble that told me like female friendships would be competitive and jealous. And to be honest with you, like I didn't feel like women were in general. I felt like some were, women were specifically. In my opinion, specific men and specific women really fucking suck. And it's a specific category of person. And if you're not in that category, you're pretty great. Men and women are pretty great friends. I've had great male friends, great female friends. And the only thing that made them shitty friends was they happened to be in a certain category of person that was often bitter and jealous and insecure and um, suffocating and inappropriate. So it wasn't really ever about gender. I have good male and good female friends. The ones who were assholes were just like, that's just the kind of person they were. Didn't ha had, just didn't have to do with their gender. Tactic, if you will, um, that is sometimes used, which can be deceiving, and that was what I was talking about in the intro, namely how you appear to others. And so, for example, you can gossip in a way that appears kind and sympathetic, and that can actually get you to be more liked simply by wording it in a way that does not appear malicious. And this article ends with explaining how women are often more aggressive than they themselves believe that they are. We often self-deceive our vicious motivations. So in other words, we may actually be unaware of our involvement in gossip and relational aggression because we truly believe that we are speaking out of actual concern and sympathy for our targets. Now, I will, of course, link this article below. I really recommend that you read it. It was really interesting, and I could only talk about parts of it here. Otherwise, this video would have been way too long. Now, while reading this article or, you know, listening to this video, parts of it can be quite uncomfortable, right? I mean, like, no one wants to believe that they ever put other women down or that they are malicious in any way, and we don't want, you know... What's the difference between putting people down who happen to be women and putting women down? Because I think there's a huge difference. Right. I think it is a huge difference to say, oh, you put men down all the time and like you put down certain men and also gossip. Fuck. I love gossip, girl. I'm going to drink that tea every day, girl. Fuck you. But also I would say that shit to your face and you don't believe me. But girl, test me. Go ahead and test me, girl. I'll say it right to your fucking face and you won't test me because you actually don't want me to say it to your fucking face. So you block you fucking bitch. OK. Test me, bitch. Test me. I'll say it right now, girl. Oh, I want to be tested. Oh, I love being tested. Fucking test me. Okay? So. Just. Okay. Well, friendships to be portrayed in a negative light. Now, the article in itself, of course, is not suggesting that we are all a bunch of highly competitive. I don't make up shit about no one. That's the difference. Don't lie about anybody. Don't fucking lie. That's it. That's the huge difference. Don't lie about people. It's fucking fucked up. Don't lie about people. Don't do that. It's fucked up. There, I just fixed 99% fixed of the world's problems. Don't lie about people. Don't lie. You can give opinions. You can say, I'm not sure, but this is how I feel. You can say, this is my observation. Do not lie. Do not lie. Boom, I just saved 99% of your fucking friendships. Competitive, jealous, gossipy pricks, but it does shed some light on some of the things that I believe Many of us don't lie so your gossip is is honest. Gossip is shitty because people lie. Don't fucking lie about people. 
The reason gossip is shitty is because you're lying, you dumb cunt. Stop lying about people. You can gossip, just don't lie. That experience. And it's interesting learning about where certain behaviors might stem from, and most importantly, to hopefully detect some of these behaviors in ourselves and work on them. But now I myself have personally absolutely experienced, you know, jealousy, um, sabotage, ostracization, and at the same time, I absolutely cannot with a clear conscience say that I myself have never taken part in those things. You know, of course I have, especially when I was an insecure teenager, I think we all have, and now I think we all have, but to mm. different extents, and I think that's important. So there's a big difference between, you know, oh, I was a bit of a prick when I was 16 because I would be jealous of the most beautiful girl in my class and I would secretly be afraid that my boyfriend would want her more than me, versus I'm a grown adult woman and I can't stand seeing beautiful women and I actively, secretly try to put them down. There's no historical or biological excuse for being a prick. And now I'd like to share with you some of my personal experiences when it comes to female friendships, specifically some of the common traits of female friendships that fizzled out versus some of the common traits of friendships that remained. Now, I want you to share your experiences in the comments as well because I would love to read it now, listener. Okay, so let's begin with the common traits of friendships that fizzled out. The emotional dumper. You know the type of friend who genuinely has no interest in you. You meet up, you spend the first hour listening to the event, and then in the midst of it, they kind of- And then they burn the bridge with you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a joke. But yeah, that's absolutely. That's why people think I'm close to them because they call me, they emotionally dump. They go, hey, how are you doing? And I go, I'm fine. And they go, man, I feel so close to you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. Because you just emotionally dumped on me. But like, we're not having a friendship. You know, we're not having a friendship. You know what I mean? Um, I'm frustrated by those friendships, but also they happen all the time. It's just normal. It's mostly people who are traumatized. That's why I say everything is trauma. I'm like, that's what trauma is. Trauma is calling a person and thinking your friendship is predicated on how much they've trauma dumped onto you. I'm used to it. People just do it because I'm a good listener. But like, that's why I say like, I'm not close to people. We're not close. You just told me your secrets, but we're not close. You don't know my secrets. We ain't close. Kind of realize that they should probably ask about you. And so they say, anyway, how are you? And you feel like you have about, I don't know, 15 seconds to word vomit until they lose interest and start talking about themselves again. They ask for your advice that they never take, by the way. And Doom says, when are you going to make more psychology type videos? I'm not a psychologist. Hello? Hello? I don't do psychology, bro. This is a therapy channel. No, see, you made me fuck up. This isn't even, this is a philosophy channel. You made me fuck up. This is not a psychology channel. I'm not going to make psychology type videos. There are plenty of therapists you can watch. Watch Dr. Kirkonda. Watch Dr. K. You can watch actual people in therapy. And they need someone to complain to. And that person is you. Hooray. The friend who hates your happiness for no reason. The friend who hates your happiness for no reason. Oh, yeah. That's bitter, dude. That's not good. That's not good. That's not good vibes. Mm -mm. Man, I don't know a lot of people who ever got close to me who are like this, though. Uh, trauma dumpers for sure. That's pretty common. That's pretty common. Um, but that friend, uh, the one who's always bitter for your happiness, that's just bad moods, bro. Strongly hold the belief that good friends are people you are excited to share good news with. The opposite of friends who will find faults in anything you share. They supposedly get a bad vibe from your new- Negative Nancy, bro. Debbie Downer. Boyfriend, despite never meeting him, they criticize your promotion and try to give you a reason not to be excited about it. Eventually, you stop feeling like sharing good news with them. And then you stop feeling like sharing any news with them. The friend who is in a constant state of crisis. Ooh, exhausting. Ooh, what's the difference from the trauma dumper and the friend who's always in crisis? Yeah, mm, they're kind of almost overlap. Ooh, the people I think about are sort of similar. Oh, the friend who's in a constant state of crisis. But oh, the trauma dumper. Ooh, ooh, that's good. Okay, I think sometimes those two overlap. And I think sometimes... They they can be different. Mm, mm -hmm. Oh, this friend who's in the state. This is the one. I have a three three time rule. I have a three time three thing rule. So I go, okay, we've tried to deal with this issue more than three times. We now have to make a decision. If we're never going to talk about it again, you're going to seek therapy or you're going to seek a professional's intervention because obviously I cannot handle this. You are in crisis too often. Red flag. And I would put my foot down and say, with peace and love boundaries. Mm-hmm. There's always a Which they're going to internalize as abandonment. And then they're going to look at you and say, you're being a bad friend. And I'm going to say, I, you're being a bad friend first by literally always being in crisis and calling me like inappropriately way too many times during the day, bro. Your life cannot. Sometimes I think people seek out the thrill of their life being a mess because it makes them feel like they're alive. 
a crazy story to tell, some drama they somehow got themselves involved in, and oh, they did not respond for a week because they lost mm. their phone, and now they need to borrow some money from you because they spent it all on a night out, and they did yeah. not. Yeah, nope, nope, useless, useless people. Ken says, what's the line between trauma dumping and sharing suffering with your friends, though? Venting versus complaining, expecting your friend, putting too much on your friends, treating your friend like a therapist, inappropriate, treating your friend like somebody who's obligated, even past their own, like, healthy point of paying attention to your needs, unhealthy, absolutely not, right? So there's a difference between saying, hey, do you have enough energy? Do you have enough spoons for me to share this thing? It's kind of a big deal. It's okay if you don't have the energy right now. And then somebody saying like, you have to call, <clears throat> I need your attention. I, you, you have to do this, you're my friend. It's like, whoa, like, again, not taking advantage of each other. The difference is always gonna come down to, are you taking advantage of this person? Because there does come a point where you're taking advantage of someone and there does come a point where you just need the help and like that person's willing to help you. So I think that that's what I pay attention to is like consent and are you taking advantage of this person? Because otherwise like your friends are more than happy to hear your problems, dude. But sometimes it's just inappropriate and sometimes your friends are enablers. Remember, some of your best friends have the best intentions and will enable you to trauma dump and like cross personal boundaries because they are like the validation seeking you coming to them for help. So even during COVID, I always tell the story about my two besties who like reached out and I was like, hey girls, we're getting to the point where now this needs like therapy, like therapy, like you need a therapist. Cause now you're asking me to do emotional labor that like I'm not, I don't even know this much about the human psychology or brain to be able to help you as a friend. This is above my pay grade. And they're like, holy shit, yeah. And they both got therapy. Because eventually when you come to your friends and you can't problem solve something, somebody needs to enact a professional. Something needs to happen. You know what I mean? And I know friends get offended. People get offended. Like, what do you mean I have to go to therapy? It's like, well, we've been having a problem. It's been six months. It's been two years. It's been some time. And every time we talk, we're running into this problem. Or every time I talk to you, I feel like you just trauma dump. Or every time I'm like starting to like like be afraid to talk to you because I know it's going to be a bad energy. You know, when you look forward to talking to your friend, you're like, can't wait. They just called. And then the relationship changes to like, I know when I talk to them, they're going to criticize the way I dress today. Or, oh, I don't want to talk to them. They're going to criticize how I talked today. Or like, oh, I don't want to talk. Like they're going to criticize. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to call my friend because I know they're just going to like be negative. Okay. So you try to problem solve it. Hey, every time I talk to you, you kind of trying to trauma dump on me or like, hey, every time we talk, I kind of feel like worried or anxious or I start feeling like a great like instead of looking forward to it, I start to feel overwhelmed with it. Um, could we like talk about why I feel that way every time we're about to call each other? Or, hey, every time I go to call you, I feel like you don't want to talk to me because you'd rather talk to somebody else. It's like, okay, we need to be able to talk this through. But if there's like a line of communication that's not going through, then I go, okay, somebody needs therapy. We need a mediator. We need to radically accept something is not working. I do this with my siblings, with my inner circle. Sometimes we're just like not vibing. No big deal. Let's take some, some time off and we'll talk again in a few months. Because sometimes you're just at different parts of your life. Uh, sometimes people are in their trauma. Sometimes you're just doing different things with your life. That's different than also uh, a friend you need to cut off. Like a friend, like I'm not going to cut off my inner circle, but a friend you want to cut off is like, hey, dude, every time we're together, I feel like I regret it. That's a me thing. But because it's a me thing, I also got to cut myself off from this interaction. So it might not even be a them thing, but it's the way you feel when you're around them that you're really paying attention to. You know, not even them. It's not about blaming them. Like, oh, they're the reason our friendship ended. You know, I would like to say, hey, when I'm around you, I feel this way. And I'm, instead of blaming you for the way I feel, I would like to invite you to be yourself. And if being yourself and being myself is causing a rift and conflict we can't solve, I'm also okay with us wishing each other the best and moving on and doing something else with life. But people don't want to hear that because they want to hear you're rejecting me. You're saying I'm the problem. Well, again, I don't want to say you're the problem. I want to say we are having a problem because the, the two people that we are when together cause conflict. Good people can cause conflict together. And unless you're willing to change, and I'm certainly not, then what are we doing? Now, of course, you might be willing to compromise and that's also okay, Right? In this situation, the kinds of friendships she's describing, she is describing like 
I think the unredeeming kinds of friendships, the ones that are super, super toxic and without great intervention probably won't be helpful. You know? Don't think about the fact that they would cost money to take a cab home and they flaked on your plans. Again, even though you were literally standing outside the bar waiting for them. The <clears throat> male obsessed one. It seems like they've- Oh my God. The male obsessed one? meaning centering their life all around men. These are all, I agree with these all red flags. I agree with her here. Value nothing more in life than male validation. Anywhere that you go, it's so that they can meet cute guys. All the clothes that they buy, it's to make the boy stare. And they don't mind glancing over your boyfriend once in a while and joke about stealing him. But hey, it's just a joke. The bad influence. Oh. I was thinking of a different trope, I think. I think I was thinking of a different trope, but I do... I do agree in general, like toxicity is toxicity is toxicity. And people who are going to encourage you to be like less better are frustrating. But people who also are way into your business are also not helpful. I have very strong boundaries with my friends. Like it's your business. I trust you. You do that. Like you do you. I trust you to do you. But also, you know, if you need me to give input, I'm going to be honest. So don't ask unless you mean it. When you're simply not better or thriving in any capacity with them, perhaps you become more superficial, you drink more, you make careless decisions, and yes, you are responsible for yourself, but I would steer clear of people who encourage and celebrate poor decisions. The same, 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 same. Sweet fragile friendship. I've had best guy friends, best girl friends, and in my experience, generally speaking, the guy friends felt more liable. You know, after an argument, I had no fear of a friendship fizzling out or if they were going to start distancing themselves from me now. Is it fixable? Am I still invited to their birthday? Will I now be ostracized in school? Whereas with guy friends, I didn't have those concerns. It always felt more stable, more like a sibling type of relationship where mm. you just know that you can show up and you can call and an argument doesn't change anything. As the saying goes, if it's fragile, let it break. Different morals and values. I like that. If it's fragile, let it break. I like that. Mm-hmm. I, I like that. It's important for me to note that not- Wait, what was this one? You can show up and you can call and an argument doesn't change anything. As the saying goes, if it's fragile, let it break. Different morals and values. Ooh, um, now nah, my friends are diverse and I like that they have different morals and values than me, but that's why I say I love them unconditionally. But girl, I do not like every part of my friends and family. I love my friends, but I do not agree with their values and morals. No, nah, I got a diverse friend group. So let's see what she says about this. My instinct is to say no. But I can understand how difficult it is. It is very hard to have friends with different values than you. Let me tell you, the debates are rampant. It's important for me to note that not all friendships fizzle out just because, you know, something serious happened or because someone is a bad person. Sometimes you just no longer see eye to eye. No. Sometimes you come to learn that there are some differences between you two that are too important to ignore. So let's say, for example, that you really value working hard, um, discipline, self-improvement, personal growth, education, and they have no interest in any of those things, and they might be very interested in other things that you don't value. So this type of misalignment could be a call for a friendship breakup. Mm. Now, yeah, I mean, I think people just naturally grow apart. I don't know if I would associate that with values. I was thinking more deeply sounded values and morals. Like, there are types of people I don't ever want to get closer to, but some of my friends are very different from me. And they're willing to do things that I wouldn't be caught dead doing. Peace and love, absolutely not. I would be mortified and embarrassed. But also, like, who the fuck cares? Like, that's your life. It's not mine. But also, I want a friendship where I can be like, but also, okay, yeah, um, yeah. I just think we have different thresholds for tolerance. That's how I look at it. It's like, what's my threshold for tolerance? Like, I can tolerate a lot of diversity, but not every form of diversity in my friendships. Like, there are some types of people I do not want around me. You know what I mean? So if he says, if you describe a friendship as fragile, you were never friends. I think it's specific. Like, I think new friends are casual friends, but all of it is friendship. But I do think, like, this goes back to the Guts and Griffith conversation. Were they ever friends? Like, I would say, of course. But some people would say a real friend wouldn't do that to you. But I would say a new friend might do that to you because you were never friends. But an old friend is more likely to betray you in, a, in some ways than new friends. And that's why the sting hurts so bad. If a new friend betrays you, it's a lot less hurtful. Like, who the fuck cares? There's some stranger who just came into your life and they're like burning the bridge with you, like who cares? But if an old friend burned the bridge, it'd be like, whoa, why are you burning the bridge after 20 years, dude? Why are you burning the bridge? Like, what are you doing? That's much more hurtful. 
And I still think it's your friend. Like a new friend who burns the bridge early is never was never your like your real friend. An old friend that burns the bridge. Holy fuck, what just happened? Not only were they your friend, but you're about to fucking hold a funeral for that friendship. That's how I look at it. Ending a 20 year friendship is a devastating change in a life. Whether you know it's for your betterment or not, that is a much more impactful situation than a friendship that just started. Who fucking cares what a new person in your life does, right? Like, it doesn't matter. But the person that's been there through thick and thin, fuck. Ending a friendship is painful. I would argue if you've had deep friendships, ending that friendship can be one of the most sourful and mourning, like deepest mourning of your life. It is so valuable to me. Maybe that's love why I love anime so much. Because the friendship relationships they have in anime is like deep and meaningful. I feel that way about my friends. I would be so sad, even if you're not in a circle, if you guys are just people that I call friends, if I enjoy your company and I feel like we have a connection, I would be devastated. Some of those people I've known for 6, 10, 12 years, if they were like, hey, I think I want to move on, I'd be like, oh my God, I respect your consent, but also I'm devastated. Like I respect your consent first and foremost. But also I will mourn this connection. You know, I will mourn this connection. You know what I mean? But if it's like a new person, like, girl, I, get, I don't know you yet. Some common traits of female friends that I still have in my life. We genuinely like each other. I can genuinely sense that they are happy for me. And I'm yes, I think that's a big deal too. I genuinely like you. Like that's a big deal. I'm equally happy for them. I want them to do well. I want them to be happy. And when they're not, when they're hurting, my heart aches and I want to help them. And when they light up, I light up. There is a mutual deep caring for one another. There is consistency. They're not going to disappear for a while and then come back and I never have to wonder where we stand, you know, if we're still friends. Ooh, um, I would, because neurodivergent here, I would qualify them coming and going as like, I don't need to qualify where we are in our friendship because I already have the stability, but also, um, Mm, yes, you you don't have to question where you stand with them, I think is important. But also people go through shit. There's mental breaks. People have like mental health crises. People are like traumatized. So obviously it's more like um, some friendships are worth fighting for and others aren't. And it's up to you to decide which ones are worth fighting for. So if they still like me, if they're sad or mad about something or if they're not telling me because I know what they would tell me and I would tell them if there's ever a disagreement. Uh, I don't need perfection from my friendships. Like, I just need people to be people, you know? And we will air it out and we'll move on. And it's just easy like that. There's nothing to be gained from one another. There are no disingenuous incentives. I don't need them for anything. They don't have money or connections or followers or clout or anything like that that I could benefit from. I am with them and they're with me purely for who we are. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I think friendships and connections and deep relationships are contingent on the relationship you're having with the consciousness, not contingent on work and other things. That's why I say I have work friends. That's why I say I have friend friends. That's because like I love work, but if work didn't exist, we wouldn't be friends. Like I love you so much. But yeah, like if, if work didn't exist, would we be friends? No, if you weren't my sibling, would we be friends? Like I love my siblings for who they are, but we also had to choose each other because there was this like assumed obligation that we would be close. But at the same time, I think those friendships are still incredibly valuable. They're just like a little bit more casual until you take them and make them more personal. Like I want to spend more concerted time with you. I want to make an effort. I want to, you know, dedicate more resources to this friendship, something like that, you know? Uh, Sleepy says, would you find it important, uh, Becca says, would you find it important to update a friend that comes and goes, like a major change, such as a new partner? Um, it depends on the friendship. So I have friends, I do not, okay, what's the definition of comes and goes? Because I have friendships, um, I don't, I'm not sure I'm using comes and goes the same way. I'm worried I'm using the words differently. You know what I mean? I think I'm using the words differently. Comes and goes. Uh... Because I have friendships like we don't talk for like 10 years or we don't talk for five years or but I love them. Like, why wouldn't I talk to them again? I just we're busy. We're doing other things like I have friends I haven't spoken to in like four or five, six years. But if they messaged me, I'd be stoked to hear from them. I just they're busy. They're adults. They're doing different things. So is that a friendship that comes and goes or is that just a friendship where I respect the fact that like we're just doing different things right now? Like we didn't end the friendship. So the friendship is still there. 
unless we end the friendship, like the friendship is still there to me. You know what I mean? Like I'm for the most part, like I don't really ghost people. So I feel like uh, now friends do grow apart and relationships naturally end. I guess. I'm not sure what it means. They come and go. Fishy says, I have friends that come and go, but when we are together, it's like no time has passed. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Is that, they must mean something. I think they mean, I think they mean something else. I think this bubble means like the friends that are so inconsistent and floppy. You never know where you stand with them. Please help me. Kay says, I spoke to a friend I didn't talk to for over seven years around Christmas time. And it was like, nothing has changed. Exactly. Yeah. Monet says, Def have friends where we really talk and see each other, but the dynamic is the same. Okay. So they must, is that what they mean? Are they talking about that kind of friendship where it's like, hey, bro, like you ditched me and then you came back into my life like we were still friends, even though obviously to me it ended. Do they, is, is, what could they mean? I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm thinking she might mean something different. Yeah. Cause some people feel like when it, um, somebody, who was that? Who asked about updating a friend? Um, I think some people feel like, how am I close to you if I'm not updating you every day about my life? But I don't believe that. I don't think I need an update every day of your life. But if big things happen, please call me with the good news. Like if it's a, if it's a romantic relationship that is significant, call me and talk to me about it. If you're just dating someone because you like, you want a new date every week, like you don't have to talk to me about those dates. I want you to share with me when you want to share with me. Like if you have something you want to tell me, call me, we'll talk about it. But obviously, if you're the kind of friend that wants to call me every day to talk about what you ate, like peace and love, girl, I've got to make a living. So if you're the kind of friend that wants to talk to me every day about like what you had for dinner, like obviously I might not have time for that conversation. But if you're like in a relationship and it's significant and a big life change happened and you want to talk to me, DM me, girl, and be like, girl, I have a life update. Call me. And I'm like, okay. Right? But like some people also, some of my friendships, they wouldn't call me. But we, they'd call me after like five kids and be like, hey, how have you been? I'm like, oh, my God, how have you been? They're like five kids now. And I'm like, oh, my God, five kids. So every I, really genuinely every friendship to me is different. I do not treat my friends the same. All my friends are different. Every relationship I have with my friends are different. I do not have cookie cutter friends. It's as Aristotle said or called it the perfect friendship. Now, when it comes to female friendships or other women in general, there's one piece of magic that I admire so much about us, and it's the unspoken language that we share. So here comes another anecdote. One time I was at a dinner type of thing. Ooh, with a few what's other that? What's that? I'm hungry and it's I can't eat. It's I just want to eat all the time. But I eat only girl dinner all the time. I love snacking. I just like a little bird. I'm like, ooh, pistachio here. Ooh, a grape here. Ooh, what's that? I want it. What is it? People. And some were single and some were coupled up. And I was there with a guy that I've been seeing for a while. Let's call him Simon. So Simon particularly enjoyed making condescending jokes about me, preferably in front of others. And on this particular oh. evening, as we were all gathered around the dinner table, and after one too many condescending jokes that no one but him found to be funny, I felt hurt, and so I became distant. Anyway, so everyone was chatting Ooh. and eating and drinking, and Simon was clueless, or he just did not care. And so I sat there, mostly quiet, and then I looked up, and I was met by the eyes from the girl sitting from across the table and I did not know her very well. And we exchanged a look. It must have lasted a few seconds, mm -hmm. but it was enough for her to let me know that she knew. Mm -hmm. And I knew that she knew. Mm -hmm. She wasn't clueless. Mm -hmm. A girl that I barely knew made me feel more seen and heard in that moment than that. Because we see parts of ourselves in each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like I have this connection with total strangers all the time. If the timing is correct and you look at each other right at the right moment, you know, you know guy who supposedly loved and cared for me so deeply. I absolutely adore how us women seem to be able to communicate almost telepathically. How I mean, I do this with men as well. Again, my male, again, gender seems to play almost no role in my life. So I have the same relationship with men and women, with anybody, just a human to human. It's like, I feel like I give you guys looks. Do you guys feel that from me? Because I feel like I give you guys looks and you get what I'm doing, especially early in this video. I didn't mean to go so hard on her, but I feel like when I look at you and I'm like, it's like I'm trying to say like, oh, this is not I'm exhausted. I'm so this is what I mean when I say I get socially exhausted when I'm around people that like are not on my like not my language, like not my bubble. 
I'm doing so much social work just to understand their language and I have to translate everything they're saying and I have to work like 10 times harder. And the same way people feel like when they see me, they're like, oh my God, what is Brittany saying? Like, I have to like think about what she's saying, but I feel like I do that with you guys, right? Okay, you guys see it. I see you. Yep. Okay, I do it. You got. You guys know. You guys know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We can communicate with mm-hmm. just a look, a tap on the arm, a one word of text, how we move a bit closer when we see a woman walking by herself at night because we know that it might provide a sense of safety mm-hmm. and comfort. How our eyes automatically search for another woman when we are on an empty subway at night and the sense of relief when we find it the familiarity in an unfamiliar female face. As women, we do that for one another and we don't even have to ask for it. And it's so cool. And it's one of those things that makes me love being a woman mm. in this world. I get <laughs> it. I, crying? I just think it's really beautiful. Okay. Gay, love I love it. Bye. Wow, she's so gay, bro. I love her. She's gay. No, her the way she speaks is a little too slow for me. That was on almost times two, bro. Um, I put a link to the video in the chat so you guys can check her out. Great video. Good job. I'm going to put it. I'm going to thumbs up it. But yeah, I, I think that's pretty common uh, for people to have to grow up and you have to learn how to make friends. You have to learn what kind of friends do you want? You know, the moral of Lana's story is simple. Stay away from toxic friendships. Agree. Stay away from toxic friends, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it happens. Sometimes you just got a negative Nancy in the friend group, you know? Sometimes you just got negative people feedback. That's why I do appreciate my siblings because we're the kind of siblings that, like, cheerlead each other. We're, like, always celebrating each other's wins. We're always, like, mourning each other's losses. Like, I checked in on my brother. He just recently transferred for a job. I was like, how's work? He's, like, killing it. I was like, fire, you know? <laughs> I'll send my brothers, like, my updated, like, here I hit a goal this month. They're like, awesome, bro. I'll send them, like, updates. Like, we send each other updates. Like, again, we celebrate each other's wins and we mourn each other's losses, bro. Like we do our best. And I think that's a learned skill, but also says something about your character. And I pay attention to people. Sometimes I'll have friends who mean the best, but bro, they cannot celebrate my wins with me. And I see it in them. I'm like, you don't have to do this with me. Or they'll like um, celebrate my losses in a way that like is about them. See, I told you. See, I told you. And I'm like, mm, nah, bro. Nah, 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 nah. It happens. It's life. You know, people are in their own issue. They have their own issues. It doesn't mean you have to throw away the whole friendship. You know, sometimes your friendships are just going to have hard moments, guys. Sometimes your friendships are going to be tough and you got to ride the wave so you make it another 20 years. But let me tell you this, and I mean this with all of my love. If you do not unconditionally love that person, then yeah, the friendship's conditional. How often you talk, when you see them, how often you agree, how good you make each other feel. Yeah. If your love is conditional, that friendship is conditional. But if you unconditionally love someone, you're going to ride the wave into the next 20 years because you're going to see like, okay, we're just having a moment. We're having a moment. The friendship isn't conditional. But if your friends say, well, I don't talk to you every day, so like I can't be friends with you, that's a conditional friendship. And that's fine. That's valuable. I have friends who are like, hey, I can't talk to you more than once a month. Maybe every two months, is that okay? And if it's not okay, I understand. But I, I, it's got to be conditional right now. It's got to be conditional. I just, I just negotiated. And that's the difference for me. My unconditional friendships are not going to say, I need to talk to you every day. Because like that doesn't make sense to me. But my conditional ones, absolutely. Brian says all relationships are conditional. I think that's a personal experience. I don't think that's true. I have unconditional relationships with certain people in my life because I have unconditional love for them. So I do not put a condition on us being friends. Like I only put a boundary on how we interact, which is different. But like I'm happy to end a friendship that's conditional. I won't end a friendship that's unconditional. Like if I love you unconditional, I'm not ending that friendship. But I might put a boundary in place that, you know, keeps me kind of like sane and happy and joyful if we're going through something together. You know what I mean? That's my personal relationship with it. You don't have to have that relationship, you know?
Ta-ta-ta-ta